Swinburne University of Technology. Hello everyone, Craig again and I'm up to lecture 10, Leah, lecture 10, social movements, um, groups, organisations and the network society. Uh, those of you who read the last lecture would uh, which was the politics lecture would have seen there was some there was there was some talk about social movements in that um, the um, uh, the textbook um, in in the way it's it's set up does introduce the notion of social movements into politics because there is the there is uh, an inevitable inter intertwining of politics and, and social movements uh, in, in much the same way that, that I was talking about um, the layering of, of power. It's, it's very hard to, to separate out um, into discrete units um, activities that, that happen in the social world and, and this is one of them. So some, I, was, I was talking about, well, I'll, I'll start at the beginning um, and I'll just integrate that, that political stuff, the stuff from the politics lecture into this. Um, this is this is a reasonably sort of diverse diverse topic because we we're dealing with um, so four notions um, um, four sort of structural notions about the world that do feed off each other and it's probably all captured in the notion of globalization um, and globalization is probably getting a bit tired and old now in terms of a, of a description but it's 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 it lives in the world. Um, globalization was was uh, a term coined by a, a sociologist called Anthony Giddens. Um, Anthony Giddens um, is is a famous sociologist, um, not only famous in in the sociological world, uh, but also famous for being Tony Blair's Tony Blair. Um, yeah, yeah, David's good with Tony Blair, um, Prime Minister of England, um, following um, following Margaret. Thatcher, uh, following, what's his name, who followed Margaret Thatcher? No, 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 um, 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 and this is the young people don't take drugs, this is what happens to you <laughs> moment. Um, um, oh, glasses, English private school looking bloke, oh, 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 it's on the tip of David's tongue, it's still well back in my head at the moment. I'll come back to you on this. Anyway, Tony Blair, uh, you all know who Tony Blair is anyway, I'm sure. Um, uh, Giddens was an advisor to, to Tony Blair uh, um, in about sort of social politics and the social world. And he, he, he coined the, um, the, the term socialization, or the, at the very least, uh, popularized it through, through his writings, which were both sociological. There's a um, a, uh, a textbook that um, that I suggest that, that you use possibly as a, a, a second one to your your text. This is this is Giddens Sociology. It's the sixth edition. Um, looks like this uh, when you're going through the library shelves. Have a look for that. Um, and look, it's a whopper. So if you if you're interested in buying it, it'll be a very good doorstop probably even stop the car rolling down the hill as well. Um, Giddens book is is terrific um, and and that's uh, uh, you'll you'll also oh I've creased it um, <laughs> you'll also note <laughs> this is amused David um, you'll also maybe I'll stand for a while I'm, I'm getting sick of uh, sitting down um, You'll also note that, that I've, I've in, in, your, um, in your course material, uh, in the unit outline, I've, I've given you a list, of, um, a list of books that you can refer to. Giddens is one of those. Anyway, Giddens, Giddens popularised popularized the, the notion of, of globalisation. So for those of you who don't know, who want sort of a definition of globalisation, globalisation is the, the, in, is the increasing interconnection of the world facilitated by the 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 digital revolution where uh, national borders are no longer important are no longer barriers to to commerce to the 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 flow of not only goods and services but but money um, organizations um, 
are now transnational uh, rather than the in the the, so the the 20th century we had multinational organizations which were which sort of indicated that you had an organization who could be in one country and and another organization in another and another organization in another so you could have Pepsi Cola America and Pepsi Cola France and Pepsi Cola South Africa and they was they were discrete institutions they were institutions under themselves um, they were all working um, under the auspices of the Pepsi Cola label but they were working separately now in the transnational world that doesn't that doesn't need to happen anymore you just have Pepsi Cola there there and there run from a, a, a central place usually a nice comfortable place where the executives can live in in relative safety and comfort uh, and then the banking may be done in some island offshore somewhere where the taxation regime is good the manufacturing is done in in a cheaper country and then the distribution is handled by by separate discrete units so that you can have a world organization orchestrated by from a central point with the different functions for the um, for the organization performed in the most cost effective place if you like so you don't have to have Pepsi Cola America being run with the executives and produced and distributed from there and then a separate organization doing that um, with another separate layer of management so you have a pile there that was working under multinationalism um, multi multinationalism yeah a pile there for France and a pile there for South Africa it's all here in the one place orchestrated from the from the central central um, sort of executive cell if you like so it's transnational in the sense that that it spans all of the nations without notable divisions between any one of them and this has obviously been facilitated by um, certainly an intentionality to to have that be the case and to not worry about um, um, having having your, your different parts of your organization working uh, working in different areas because with the the digital revolution things can be instructions can be given and move moved around e relatively easily when uh, oh now I've got to I've got to lecture 10 without saying when I was young that's remarkable I usually in a lecture I can usually go when I was young and I'll look at my watch and go well that's taken me 20 minutes um, this is taking me 10 lectures when I was young um, uh, Kim, um, I worked in the rag trade for for a while when I was a kid um, and the one of, well all of the companies I worked for did manufacture overseas um, but it was it was it was a difficult process you'd 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 actually go and buy the fabric in one country you'd bring it to Australia then you'd have to send it to to another country and there'd be people accompanying this process all the way um, and then the communication was by, via telexes and a telex was like a some of you will have no idea what a telex is telex was like a big typewriter um, that was automated so I'd send a message because it made that tickle what that you know that typewriter sound <laughs> yeah. so you write the message and then you press the button and it's sent it off through the wires to the other place and so you'd be standing around having a chat and suddenly your typewriter would start typing and your telex would come up as a um, as a as sort of a printed document and you know that could take ages for for it to come through so that that was the beginning of sort of the multinational world but now with the 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 digital world bang it's gone you know and you can skype your people wherever they are so okay what's then underpinned that are, are governments have been prepared to to do things like float their dollar open up their financial systems um, as we did in the mid 1980s so this has been going on for quite a while um, so so um, and I was talking about that I think in the last lecture about um, how um, the economic system and, and the links um, between the economic systems throughout the world are facilitated by political decisions and that was that was also I, I, I didn't describe it as such but that was also a, uh, a manifestation of globalization so globalization um, 
obviously was embraced by, by companies profit making organisations because it gave them much greater opportunity to um, increase their profits and decrease their costs by, by being able to move things offshore and have tax effective regimes by moving your money around and, and to have sort of a centralised organisation, executive organisation that was, was sort of safe and comfortable and then governments have facilitated this process by allowing international companies in, by allowing international companies to take over, um, local companies to uh, promoting free trade across the world and having free trade agreements with all sorts of um, other countries. So we, the the notion of 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 globalisation underpins then this this world of of sort of networks and social movements and groups and organisations. So um, that's the 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 corporate world and and the governmental world, and then. Um, this digital revolution has also meant that that movements, social movements, have been able to work more effectively together and to orchestrate worldwide responses to um, to the way the world works and or doesn't work as as these organisations see it. So, um, from from a strictly social point of view, the obviously Facebook is the the ubiquitous example now. Um, but simply by having emails, by having, by having text um, message ability and, and Skype meant that communication could happen much more effectively. Um, satellite technology obviously is, um, is, well if something's the foundation, what's satellites? Uh, John Major, just by the by, John Major. Um, so satellite technology has, has facilitated this. So the Sea Shepherd can be down in the Southern Ocean chasing the Japanese and still give us reports back by, via satellite phone. Um, so that, that social movements and social actions can, can be in real time followed by people. Um, so uh, what I was mentioning in the uh, in the politics lecture was you you had the probably the earliest of the the modern social movements anyway was the was Live Aid, um, followed by um, Make Poverty History, which was um, a, a worldwide response to to problems they had in Africa um, and Bono and um, what's his name the Irish bloke, hey. Huh? No, 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 no. What's his name? I don't like Mondays. Oh, oh God. Uh, Bob Geldof. Bob Geldof. Um, I do know these things. It's just you know, and it's still only early, relatively. Um, so Bob Geldof and, and Bono, uh, uh, together with a uh, whole lot of rock stars, but then governments um, and government organized and uh, non-government organizations then all came together as a result of this to, to start to distribute the money essentially which was what they were after and this became a movement, this became a worldwide movement that we could all engage in and all watch and, and uh, at various times I suppose people have had those rubber, um, um, what do you call it? Rubber, anyway, rubber wristbands um, with Make Poverty History written on them. That, that movement um, yeah, that well, wonderful example of globalisation where where these things have been produced worldwide and distributed worldwide. Um, to be fair to um, George Harrison and I think Bob Dylan and the others, you did have the concert for Bangladesh, which I think, and maybe, maybe you'll be able to think of others, but I think that was sort of the first movement, social movement, um, done in the context of popular culture associated with a movement because the other thing about this social movement is it's it's associated with a social movement as well. Um, back then when when George Harrison was doing the concert for Bangladesh the movement was the sort of the hippie rock and roll generation um, which was was still a, a sort of a reasonably discreet although sort of worldwide movement, but it didn't have the connections, it didn't have the facilities that, that these did had, have, whereas the, the social movements now uh, uh, have gone beyond the sort of discrete sort of rock 
fan, if you like, to to a much wider group, so that then people like Bono and and Bob Geldof have have become um, uh, popular figures way beyond their influence um, in terms of of their their antecedents in in the um, pop music industry. They've become influential political players, uh, facilitated by. Our, our ability now to connect um, simply and easily. Um, that was followed by um, S11, which was was a uh, sort of an anti-globalisation movement that um, that was particularly focused on on the the excesses of capitalism. Um, and and they were um, there are a number of, of meetings of sort of the G7 or the G8 and then the the G20. Um, where the big countries of the world were getting together to talk about um, economic economic issues, usually in the interests of the big companies. So, so the S11 protest movement um, um, was then responding to that and and mobilising worldwide. So there was there was a big demonstration in Seattle. There was one here in Melbourne um, a few years ago. Um, the um, even you'd have to say the protests in England last year where uh, a lot of people went mad and, and started uh, destroying local local shops and looting uh, even those were relying on the ubiquity of, of mobile phones and they, even the brand got mentioned in in the reports because they were they were talking about blackberries um, and the BlackBerry being used as as a means of of connecting people um, in this, um, although it's not quite a social movement, it was a um, a, a, a gathering of people um, based around a response. And you, you could argue that that um, although it seemed, although it obviously was a a, a terrible thing that happened um, because ultimately there were people killed in the, the English riots um, and although it was looting and, and, and greed and people stealing runners and running away with televisions, um, you can read into that um, uh, certain factors that have caused people to, to respond in that way. Um, and I think the other, the other, the other key thing that, that we need to consider in in the the social movement in terms of social movements um and 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 there are various now i mean we have the occupy movement that's that's uh that's been happening a around the world talking about the one percent again this is a, a movement in response in in i suppose specific response to a global financial crisis um and the fact that it seems like out of the global financial crisis um We've we've seen those in power retain their power, retain their wealth, um, being bailed out by governments and being protected by by governments to a certain extent. Protected in the sense that governments, um, apart from Lehman Brothers, uh, felt that banks were too big to fail and 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 inevitably bailed these out. And the people who made the bad decisions um, and the rating agencies that um, that gave these collateralized debt. Um, option can CDOs collateralized debt authorities options anyway um, these things that the, the financial institutions were selling which they knew were duds these were were essentially first mortgages um, lent to people who um, who were poor at honeymoon interest rates for an extended period of time. Um, after that honeymoon ended, they were going to jump so high that there was no chance that these people were going to, to be able to afford them. They were sold, resold as packages throughout the world. Again, this is uh, like there were, there were municipalities in Australia that bought these CDOs, these collateral, collateralized debt options, I think they were. Um, uh, so the, and, and of course, the global financial crisis ensued partly built around those sort of radical and irresponsible financial practices um, but we had to take care uh, to a certain extent we had to take care of that or the whole economic system may have got financial system may have collapsed the occupy movement then responded to that and is sort of continuing to respond to that in in limited form and talking about the one percent the one percent of people who have have control um, 
But the other, uh, on, on bringing it down at a level, the, uh, this is all posited on the notion of the networked society, that is everybody is connected in various ways. And as I was showing you in earlier lectures, I've got three, three devices here, all of which broadly do the same thing, all of which are Macintoshes, are uh, Apples, um, that allow me anywhere, well, except where I live, up in the Dandenongs, where I, I can't get reception on the phone, um, because I'm with Optus, um, um, all of these allow me to connect with any, anywhere in the world, and I can pick this, this computer up if it wasn't tied to, get to all sorts of other things like external hard drives and ethernets and all of that. I can walk around with, with this thing. I can walk around the city with this or with this iPad and sit down in a cafe and connect with, with the world. It's, it's quite remarkable when I consider when I was a kid, or oh, I've done it twice now that I was at my grandma's house with the old black Bakelite phone that, that weighed quite a bit that was tick 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 and now and I was watching Dick Tracy on the television talking to his his phone which had a video screen on it you know da da da, da calling Dick Tracy anyway you some of you will know Dick Tracy um, now I can ring up somebody with this phone on FaceTime and talk to them and see them and they can talk to me and see them it's and I'm only 57 um, so this, this, this is based on, on this, uh, uh, these changes are based on the fact that we're all networked. Um, but what I was getting to is the interesting thing now is Facebook. And as much as um, some of us have, have resisted Facebook, Facebook uh, as a social connector and as, as sort of a social movement in itself um, has 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 helped to change the nature of relationships um the the na the, the notion of friendship has has also been challenged by by facebook um and i thought in the last couple of years that facebook may go the way of what's the other one myspace, MySpace thank you very much um uh, once it started to be be populated by other groups, but it seems like like Facebook has been able to to move from simply a personal or an interpersonal private in inverted commas way of connecting to to being um, ubiquitous in the sense that you can have individuals non government organizations governments business organizations we we seem to trans to have transcended this this arbitrary division between various elements in in the social world and they've all met on facebook um so that we were just dave and i were just listening to the abc and listening to to julia gillard and they kept reminding us that we can go on to facebook and and make comments to the abc page and then i suppose um and there's no doubt my daughter will have big head saying stuff about what's going on on Facebook. So I'll go and I'll look at the personal reflections. I can go to the ABC, see what they, they have to say. No doubt the Labor Party will have st stuff on Facebook. So the, it's, the social movement, the notion of a social movement has, has, has sort of met and, and sort of hardened diamond-like around, around Facebook. Um, the thing to be wary about this is Facebook is is a private institution. You know, Facebook isn't isn't run by by governments. Isn't run in in our own interests. It's run in the interests of of the people who own it. It's much much bigger, obviously. I th well, yeah, I think obviously than they expected it to be, and its influence has has is growing, and it it will be interesting to watch. And I I'm I'm not. A social visionary, so it'll be interesting to see where it ends up. But in terms of of the development of social movements and and how how visible that's made parts of the world that haven't been visible before, that is the action of governments, the actions of organisations. Um, I'll give a cursory mention to WikiLeaks, 
now, which is um, WikiLeaks run by an Australian called Julian Assange, who may <laughs> by now be in Switzerland, is Switzerland? Or Sweden, Switzerland, I think, um, and be on his way to America and Guantanamo Bay, <laughs> who knows? Um, but WikiLeaks um, uh, was able to, to take, to receive, um, a documentation from governments uh, that they didn't want us to see and have that distributed worldwide. Um, it's, it's sort of interesting that, that, that these things revealed so much but, but uh, didn't get the response that, that maybe they expected. It didn't bring governments down, it didn't, it didn't fundamentally change the nature of, of the um, the organisations that, that they were uh, they were revealing, but it did reveal something about how organisations are responding to these social movements and, and these social networks. And setting aside what Julian Assange may or may have not done in his private life, it's it's interesting to see the response of governments to this new technological world because all Assange. What Assange did was receive documents. All right, he 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 or his offsider set up this brilliant electronic way of dropping documents in that that meant that people couldn't be identified and they could know they could drop them in the the WikiLeaks Dropbox without being traceable. And so somebody's done that, and he's done what every journalist would would have done. He's then published them. But um, despite the effectiveness of the internet, still it's interesting that, that the material that WikiLeaks had uh, had its greatest impact when it went to the newspapers, to the Guardian in England and to the Age in Australia. Um, and obviously they, they could be read on the internet, but it was, it was the distribution through the newspapers that really, really made a difference. And then if you think of the response that's happened to that, um, Assange is being rigorously pursued um, by, by the American government. Julia Gillard had something to say about, about Julian Assange, which she, she regretted and recanted on a bit later, accusing, well, calling him guilty. Um, um, yet the perpetrators, if you like, the serious perpetrators were the newspapers. Uh, uh, the Age and the Guardian in particular printed all of this stuff, did exactly what they're accusing Julian, Julian Assange of doing. But it's interesting that governments haven't gone after the newspapers and what that tells us is despite the, the network society, despite the, the digital um, globalization of the world, the power of the press and the power of print is still very strong and sufficiently strong for governments to lay off the newspapers and to, to pursue this, this individual. So we are living in a globalized world, we're living in a network world, we're living in an electronic world, we're living in a digital world, um, but one that still still has, has connections with the older world that you can, you can take back to the, the 16th century when Gutenberg first invented the printing press, when, when f for the first time somebody could put something through a machine and produce print on, on, a pap on a piece of paper and distribute it to people. The newspapers are still sufficiently powerful for governments not to want to to mess with them, uh, and I suppose they're enhanced by their, their connection to the digital world. So, I'll sit down again now. Um, that's lecture 10. I'll be back next week with, um, with lecture 11, so I'll see you then. Bye-bye. This has been a Swinburne production. 